Salutations, respected viewers. I am George from Ireland, and this video is about Catholic Unionists. Now, many people watching this will not be Irish, so I ought to um, explain some of the terms here. A Unionist uh, in Ireland is somebody who would like Ireland, or at least part of it, to be united with Great Britain, um, as in the Act of Union passed in uh, 1800. Um, so, Catholics are a type of Christian. Um, Roman Catholics, we might say to be more precise, since the head of our church is the Pope, who lives in Rome. Um, we generally call ourselves Catholics. I I'm from a Catholic background, I'm not, I'm not religious though. Um, but uh, other people say Roman Catholics. If you read The Informer by Sean O'Callaghan, an IRA man who turned against the IRA, he said, when we heard the Reverend Paisley, this Unionist Protestant politicians calling us Roman Catholics, we said, we're not Italian, just call us Catholics. Um, anyway, there's a fantastic book about this subject called The Cross of St. Patrick. Uh, it's by um, George Chowdhury Best, a Conservative MP for a constituency in Essex. He died years ago. Fascinating background. But Chowdhury um, is an Indian surname. So I think he had some Indian um, or Bangladeshi um, ancestry. So um, in Ireland, perhaps 80% of the population are nominally Catholic. About 20% are nominally Protestant. Obviously, the Protestants are heavily concentrated in Northern Ireland. If you look at the Republic of Ireland, the Catholic figure would be rather higher. Of course, there's some people who are non-religious now, and we have some uh, Muslims in Ireland. We have no other uh, religious communities of significant size, of as much as 1% of the population besides uh, Muslims. So there's a strong cor correlation between Catholicism and nationalism. That's to say, a high majority of Catholics wanted um, autonomy for Ireland, or total separation from Great Britain in some cases. Um, and again, uh, um, Protestantism correlated quite closely with Unionism, the, the desire to see Ireland, or at least Northern Ireland, united with Great Britain. Um, so the Cross of St. Patrick, uh, this book, as in it's about the, the well, it takes its name from, from the um, Irish saltire, as in a white field with a red X on it. That is the Cross of St. Patrick. Not many people know that. That was a flag of Ireland in the 18th century, scarcely ever used these days. That was used for the Kingdom of Ireland. You'll see it on, um, you'll see it in Tralee, I think it's their town flag. Um, I've seen it on buildings in, 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 uh, in London, but I suppose people have no idea what it's really about. Various chivalric orders, when we were united with Great Britain, or prior to that somewhat connected to England and Wales, not to Scotland for a while, um, for various People who honoured got to be part of the most noble order, St. Patrick, and that was part of their symbol. But on and on. So um, th that book by um, George Chowdhury Best, well, it goes back to the 12th century, to when, when England and Wales began to have a political connect connection to Ireland, um, not to the whole of Ireland. I, I shan't narrate the whole story. And so some people in Ireland accepted this, or thought it was a good thing. We should have some political uh, connection to our neighbour. Uh, and others did not, but that was that. So you could be, if, if you accepted that the King of England was also Lord of Ireland, you could be re regarded as a loyalist. Some people thought it was bad news, and they were rebels. Obviously, many people are indifferent or neutral, don't even think about such questions. But uh, what we're really talking about is, uh, is from New Year's Day 1801 onwards, because that is when uh, the, uh, the Act of Union took effect. Now, um, as, a, as an Irish Catholic, if you say that you want Ireland, or at least Northern Ireland, to um, be part of the United Kingdom or have some political connection to Great Britain, you're often told that you're terrible, you're a West Brit, although that expression, West Brit, has undergone reclamation. You might be seen as a Judas, perhaps accused of having sold out for 30 pieces of silver. Um, you're a collaborator with the enemy, and like, as though we should assume that the English are our enemies, or to a lesser extent the Welsh and Scots, that we should definitely want to be separated. You just should go without saying. They might think it's bad enough if a Protestant wants this, but if a Roman Catholic wants this, it's absolute anathema. So it takes a little bit of moral courage to, to, take, uh, to say this thing, and at times it would have taken an immense degree of physical courage, because it would have been uh, more than worth your life to say it. Uh, it would be really very dangerous at certain times and certain places to say that. And at the very least, the person would have been sent to Coventry. The person would have been blackguarded. His or her motives would have been impugned. That um, you, uh, you're, um, you're a sellout. You're an Uncle Tom. You're taking the side of the enemy against their own people. That's the way many bigots would have seen it. Um, people would have been 
um, labeled with that branding reproach traitor. So let's remind ourselves where uh, Catholicism came to from Ireland. Well, if we go back to St. Patrick, he obviously came from Great Britain, the west coast of Great Britain. There was no such concept of Wales, England, um, or indeed uh, Scotland at that time in the 5th century AD. Um, so we often say Wales, the west coast of Great Britain, but it might have been in England, it might have been Scotland, we just don't know. But England, Scotland, Wales didn't exist as such back then. Now, so he brought us Christianity. He spent some time in Gaul, France as it is now, becoming a bishop. It's claimed that he was dispatched by the Pope to evangelise in Ireland. Don't know if that's true. Some people say that's a medieval invention by the Catholic Church. But anyway, if it is true, Catholicism came to us from Great Britain. Doesn't prove that we need to be united uh, with Great Britain. But uh, if you're a Catholic, you have to acknowledge that not everything that has come to Ireland from our eastern neighbour is uh, dreadful. Um, and uh, what else? So Henry II was the first King of England to come to Ireland and to be accepted as the Lord of Ireland by the Irish Church, the Synod of Cashel, when our bishops got together in Tipperary and agreed that, uh, or um, 1175, the Treaty of Windsor, where the High King of Ireland, he um, uh, did fealty to Henry II and announced that he was his liege man of life and limb. Uh, so recognising Henry II's suzerainty over Ireland, as well as England, Wales, Normandy, much of France, Aquitaine. So um, Henry II had come to Ireland for a number of reasons, but one of them had been Lord Abilita, that papal bull in 1154. Um, a bull is a papal announcement, so it's called, not called bull, short for bulletin. No, it's from bulla, the Latin for lead, since it was sealed in lead. These documents would have some hot liquid put on them and then stamped with a seal to show that it's by him as it was not a forgery, an authentic document, and saying that um, he wanted Henry II to bring Ireland back to the uh, Roman Catholic Church, which had drifted away. We had our own Irish church. We said Mass in Irish, our monks' tonsure was different, with a different way of calculating that movable Feast of Easter and all the rest of it. We promoted clerical marriage, which has just been outlawed in the Catholic Church, things like that. Now, I wouldn't mind if we'd kept our separate church. I don't have a strong belief that we definitely had to be part of the Roman Catholic Church. I'm, I'm agnostic on that question. But if you do believe in Catholicism, you don't have to believe this, this uh, is a good thing, therefore. Um, and indeed that the Pope uh, had control over islands. There was that, that was part of the donation of Constantine. That's why he had Sicily in his gift and England in his gift. England is not an island, it's about half of an island, but that's why Alexander II, that Pope, was able to give it to William the Duke of Normandy, when giving Sicily to other Normans and so on. Um, so uh, then the Pope recognised this as lawful, had no difficulty saying that the King of England is also Lord of Ireland, and so on. So in Catholicism, we believe in rightful authority. You could look through the Catechism of the Catholic Church. There's a very fat tome of some questions of answers about what do we believe. And obviously, we must render unto Caesar what is Caesar's. Um, so the Catholic Church had no hesitation in recognising that Ireland and England were politically connected that they shared the same uh, head of state. Um, so we can fast forward some centuries, and uh, obviously England had, um, had the Reformation, so had Ireland. The difference was obviously in England, in Wales, later in Scotland, majority of people were, were Protestants of one stripe or another, but in Ireland the majority of us stayed Catholics, including the descendants of these English, Welsh um, immigrants from the, uh, from the 12th century. Um, and the Catholic majority was discriminated against by the Protestant minority in Ireland, and uh, only bits of the East Coast had a Protestant majority. Um, so I won't go into all the particulars of that. Uh, but look at the 1790s after the French Revolution and uh, radical notions really took hold in Ireland. There was a United Irishman said that we should have an equitable state of affairs in Ireland and break the connection with England, as Theobald Wolfe Tone said. But the, the Roman Catholic Church was being severely persecuted in, in revolutionary France. The, the, the main group to be guillotined by the French revolutionaries were not aristocrats, were not counter-revolutionaries, were priests. So the, um, the, the, the French Republic was at war against the uh, papacy. I, I mean literally at war. Uh, so invading Rome, taking the Pope prisoner, fighting against uh, the Swiss Guard, because the Pope had his own army, still does. It was a serious army of thousands of soldiers back then. He'd also had his pontifical navy, which was quite a formidable force at one stage. So at the same time, in, in Ireland, um, as well as in Great Britain, uh, Catholics, we had obviously freedom to worship. We had churches all over the place. Now, um, so the discrimination had ended there, but become severe in France. 
And despite that, the United Irishman wanted to take the side of France against our uh, kith and kin uh, in Great Britain. Um, so obviously we had monasteries, we had monks and nuns and worshipping. We, we'd had penal laws before, discriminated against us, the Catholic majority, and uh, mistreated the clergy. Um, said they weren't allowed in and this and that. And that the, the Church of Ireland had been set up in the 1530s. It seized the church buildings, a reformed church, and uh, the Catholics we were forced to worship outside at, at, at a mass rock and um, go to these holy wells. Often they were... Um, they were dating back to pre-Christian times to our ancient Celtic mythology, and we just had reimagined them as, as uh, Catholic saints. Um, anyway, so the Act of Union was coming up, and um, Pitt the Younger said, we'll pass this Act of Union, Ireland and Great Britain will be completely united, and there'll be Catholic emancipation, there must be equality before law for Catholics and uh, Protestants. Well, he got one of the two. Obviously, our Parliament in Dublin passed that, London passed similar legislation and the Act of Union was there. And prior to that, there'd been Catholic chaplains in the army and the navy. So by the way, we had an Irish army as well. There was the British army too, and there were some British units stationed in Ireland. Where there were other things like militia, part-time soldiers in Ireland, infantry, and the yeomen, part-time soldiers again. Now, the thing is, the wealthy in Ireland were almost exclusively uh, Protestants for various reasons, partly because of anti-Catholic discrimination uh, earlier on. And Maynooth, that is the main college a seminary in Ireland for training Catholic clergy, obviously founded in the 1790s by the UK government. We weren't even part of the UK. We were founded by them and funded by them. So uh, difficult to maintain the argument that they are so um, anti-Catholic. Um, so the union came about, but unfortunately the Catholic emancipation wasn't passed for 29 years. And that time lag was fatal. It undermined people's faith in uh, the union. Um, and nationalism began to grow again. Uh, so look at the British Army, the Royal Navy, and so on. So so many um, Catholics joined that. At one stage, the British Army was a third Irish. That's the mid-19th century. Proportionally much more Irish than it was English or anything else. So British imperialism, that was wrought by us. If you think it was good, if you think it was wicked, whatever, we did it. So we ought to own it, acknowledge that. And if it is such a foul thing, as many Irish nationalists profess to believe, then we ought to say, oh, that was bad of us, and we ought to pay compensation. But we don't want that. We only want Great Britain to do that. And joining the Royal Irish Constabulary, which is the Irish Constabulary, the police. All these things involved oath of loyalty to the Crown. There was no conscription to any of these things. You might say, oh, they were conscripted by poverty, which is obviously a lame argument that I have to apply to every job. Yes, everybody needs to work. That doesn't mean they don't believe in what they're doing just because they're paid for it. You do your job, presumably you think it's a worthwhile thing to do, not just enjoyable, but maybe contributing to society, maybe serving some sort of moral duty. You can't live without pay. So these things are not mutually exclusive, receiving money and believing what you're doing. Now, obviously most soldiers and sailors, if they're in a conflict, they don't really know what it's about. They don't um, muse over it very much. They're not all political philosophers. They're not all international relations experts or they're not all scholars of jurisprudence, but they would have some sort of loyalty to the country that they're serving. So like soldiers in the Irish Defence Forces today, do they not believe in the Republic of Ireland? Do they not salute their flags sincerely? I think they do. Just because they're paid doesn't mean that they don't believe in what they're doing. Um, and I realise there's some people who will just do anything for a mess of pottage, but I don't think that's, that's the case with most of us. I think there's a little bit of attachment and emotion there. Or, anyway, so the RIC, Royal Irish Constabulary, that was the police. Obviously only given the prefix royal after 1867, defeating the Irish Republican Brotherhood, this ultra-nationalist insurgency. The civil service that's still serving the United Kingdom. Um, anyway, there, there were various uh, Irish uh, Unionist uh, politicians. Well, there's a Blenner, Hassett family in Kerry. I can't remember all the people to name. You'd have to, I'd have to read the book again. And we produced colonial governors an Irish Catholic governor of Hong Kong in the 19th century. Then I'm told, oh, the English absolutely hate us. All right, there was some hibernophobia. Let's not exaggerate it. Why was there no anti-Irish legislation or anti-Catholic legislation at that stage? If they really hate us, why on earth would we be appointed to high office? You go back to um, even the time of Elizabeth I and um, A. Moore, okay, that's, that's Hugh O'Neill, going and being educated at her court. Well, this time, well, from Henry VIII onwards, there's a policy of surrender and regrant are uh, native Irish chieftains often uh, renouncing their uh, traditional Gaelic titles and getting a new title from the King of Ireland, uh, Henry VIII, uh, and it went like that. Um, so reaffirming their um, 
uh, allegiance to him. And yes, there were sometimes rebellions against uh, the crown, just as there were in England or Wales or Scotland or anywhere in the world. Not always for nationalist reasons like people pretend, often over, uh, let's say, uh, taxation, religious policy, unpopular governors, just power play. Um, you look at the 16th century, there were far more rebellions in England than there were in Ireland, despite in Ireland the government having weak control, because obviously the centre of government was, was uh, London. Obviously in Dublin it was a devolved government, if you will. There was a Lord Deputy there, who usually wasn't Irish. So a rebellion stood a much greater chance of succeeding in Ireland, just because the Crown had fewer soldiers there, which is further from the King, take longer for letters to get from him and be sent back by him. Or, anyway, all sorts of colonial governors who are Irish, and Irish Catholics as well, because nationalists usually say, yes, we accept Protestants as, as, as Irish, except when this seems to undermine their case. Oh, well, he doesn't count as Irish because he's Protestant. That Duke of Wellington, uh, or various um, Irishmen or Prime Minister of the United Kingdom, or Lord Lansdowne, or George Canning, or John Major, or Tony Blair, or Henry Campbell Bannerman, um, and so on, or people of Irish stock. Sorry, am I getting that wrong? It's the other one. Um, Bona Law, Andrew Bona Law, that's who I mean, not Campbell Bannerman. So, because I go by the rugby rule, if you have so much as one parent born in Ireland, anywhere in Ireland, you could be, you can be Irish. Well, citizenship rule as well. Um, so, um, so Michael O'Dwyer, I blush to mention, was Irish. The man who was governor of the Punjab at the time of the Amritsar massacre, 1919. I wonder whether Sir, whether Brigadier General Dyer was as well, because he went to Middleton College in, in Cork. And if he wasn't from Ireland, it was odd that he'd come from India all the way to Ireland to go to school. If it was English, he probably went to school in England. There was the Martin family in Galway. They're Catholics as well. And Galway, something like 95% Catholic elected Unionist MPs till about 1900. So heroic work. It was David against Goliath, because remember in the southern three provinces, almost everybody was a nationalist outside Dublin, you know, home rulers winning constituencies with 90% of the vote. So um, you have to salute people's valour for standing up to this and being a dissident. So dissent is patriotic. Uh, it's just so easy to follow the crowd and play it safe and be sheepish. So there were anti-home rule rallies um, uh, in the north in the run-up to the Home Rule Act. And I read in one account that some Catholic priests were present to demonstrate against Home Rule. I don't know if that's true, because they didn't provide any details. There was one um, uh, professor at Maynooth who seemed to be a Unionist. That was Father Walter MacDonald. And um, he even uh, wrote an article in which he said that uh, His Majesty's government uh, had the moral right to conscript men for the British Army in the First World War, saying, we are part of the United Kingdom, rightfully, you might not like it, you might be campaigning to end it, but we are legally and rightfully part of it. That could change, but at the moment we're in the United Kingdom and a government has a duty to defend its land and all the rest of it. A government has a lawful duty to declare war. You look at the legal and moral case for the First World War, as in Belgium was invaded, they didn't know anything against Germany. There was this treaty that both Germany and the United Kingdom were signatories to, to respect Belgium's independence and neutrality. Germany broke that without any justification whatsoever. The United Kingdom offered the Germans a chance to withdraw to avoid war, they refused to do so. War was declared, and, and so on. So in order to win that war, you might need to introduce conscription. Let's do it. The Catholic Church did not oppose conscription in France, in Spain, in Portugal, in Germany, in Austria, in Italy, in Switzerland, in really any country in the world besides Ireland and Australia. Of course, the Catholic Church in Australia was mostly Irish. Um, so uh, that was that. Anyway, so the height of this home rule controversy, Sir Dennis Henry is a Catholic guy from uh, Derry, uh, he was elected a Unionist MP and he went to Orange Halls where um, Orangemen voted for him yeah, to be their candidate. They adopted him at these meetings and he was a practicing Catholic to the, to the end of his life. No secret about that. Um, so we're always told that uh, Orangemen are so anti-Catholic, but I wonder why they were so happy to invite him in. And he rose to some high position, I think was Solicitor General for Ireland. And obviously, if there hadn't been severe intimidation from uh, the Republican movement, more Catholics would have stepped forward. So talk about the B Specials. That was a part of the Royal Ulster Constabulary. Remember, in 1921, the partition of Ireland, the RIC in the south dissolved, became Cardiff Corner. That's the police. And in Northern Ireland became the Royal Ulster Constabulary. And there were some B Specials, as in um, uh, part-time police officers. They do their ordinary job, perhaps one day a week, they would do policing duties, but they had they had minimal training. Um, 
and uh, people don't like to remember this, the Bee Specials were founded on the suggestion of Michael Collins, um, sometime IRA Director of Intelligence, people say he was head of the IRA, Finance Director of the IRA, and later um, Chairman of the Executive Council of the uh, Provisional Government of the Irish Free State. A bit like the first Taoiseach, though that wasn't actually his title. Anyway, Collins said, well, in the North, let's have these more, more RIC, and they go around in threes, one Catholic, two Protestants, to reflect the religious uh, um, composition of the six counties. But uh, very few Catholics joined. Often they're intimidated out by, uh, the, uh, by the IRA, who didn't want uh, the uh, Royal Ulster Conservatives to have so much legitimacy. Obviously, Collins was, was a perjurer all the time, he was always uh, reneging on the deal. He's sending weapons to uh, kill the RIC, to kill Protestant civilians, um, even after the truce. And it's true that loyalist terrorists were also killing Catholic civilians in serious numbers. Um, what else about um, uh, Collins and this? So, and of course, some, there were some loyalist terrorists who infiltrated the uh, RUC, members of the uh, of Ulster Protestant Association. Um, so for that reason, some Catholic officers resigned from it. Anyway, but there were Catholics in the B-Special, certainly in the, as late as the Second World War. And there were men from the South, whether Catholic or Protestant, who were in the B-Specials. And the, the years were so quiet in the 1930s. The RUC was so accepted, guys could live south of the border and actually go to the North, perform their um, B-Specials duties. Uh, so men from the South volunteered for the British Army all the time, well after partition, even to this day. Not in huge numbers. Only in the 70s did it become, start to become controversial. Okay, there was the GAA, Gaelic Athletic Association, founded in 1884. You look on their website and it says 1887, we were taken over by the IRB, Irish Republican Brotherhood. The IRB was a, was a precursor to the IRA and actually the two organizations overlapped a bit, but I won't go into that. And um, the GAA has these sports hurling, Gaelic football, camogie for women, and says that uh, anyone who's served serving in the British Armed Forces or the police, uh, it's not allowed to join the GAA, or anyone who draws a pension from those forces is not permitted to join the, the GAA. So the GAA was a very nationalist force, to some extent even a Republican, naming a lot of its uh, sports grounds after IRA men. Um, so if you grew up as a Catholic and grew up playing Gaelic games, that's another disincentive to join the Crown forces because you wouldn't be allowed to be in the GAA, which might well have been the centre of your social world. Some people in the GAA because they like sport, some people like the identity, the community, it might be squinted with nationalism. For some people, they're more towards the political side of it. So, um, you know, if, if, if the British Army was so anti-Catholic or anti-Irish anti-Catholic, we wouldn't, it's not, there wouldn't be so many of us joining uh, the British Armed Forces, especially after 1921, when there was an Irish army to join, where you could get a salary there, and an Irish naval service and all the rest of it, and an Irish um, Army Air Corps. If it really was the worst thing, should we go on hunger strike rather than join? You want a job, you could join the French Foreign Legion, as well as just going to America, you didn't have to go that far. So um, obviously there were judges when we were part of the United Kingdom, um, swearing oaths of allegiance, and many of them were Catholics. Um, so uh, then we took a look at the political parties. We always think unionists, that's a member of the Ulster Unionist Party, or nowadays, mainly the Democratic Unionist Party. That's true, but there weren't other parties that were pro-union. Look at the Northern Ireland Labour Party. So the Northern Ireland Labour Party said, yes, we want to keep Ireland part of, part of um, the United Kingdom, but we're not going to make a song and dance about it. We're not all about King Billy. We're not going to have to display the British flag because some people, you know, they will vote NILP, but they don't want to overemphasize British nationality. They care about helping the poor, social justice, the class struggle. That's what really matters to them. So some people who come from a nationalist background might be willing to join the NILP, but if we're going to be constantly waving the red, white, and blue, that would be a bit much for them to stomach. So, but the Northern Ireland Labour Party was pro a union. Another thing is, is the first partition in Ireland was the, the partition of the labour movement. Uh, the trades unionism was mainly an urban phenomenon, so Belfast, part of the UK Labour Party, and Dublin, a separate Irish Labour Party. Um, and then eventually the UK Labour Party wouldn't let Labour in Northern Ireland in, so the NILP had to be separate. The Liberal Party also existed in Northern Ireland. Remember, to the 1880s, the Liberals were the major party in Ireland, and the Home Rule Party supplanted them. Anyway, but the Liberals stood for Parliament in Northern Ireland from partition onwards, and they only ever had one MP, Sheila Murnahan, who was a Catholic lady, who'd come up from the South, a barrister, I think the first woman called to the Bar of Northern Ireland. So she wanted Northern Ireland to stay in the United Kingdom. She took the oath um, of allegiance. She was in the Stormont Parliament, by the way, not Westminster. 
Because remember, Northern Ireland, you elected an MP for Stormont, the Parliament of Northern Ireland. You also elected an MP to Westminster. Confusing, I know. So about 60 members of Parliament in the Northern Ireland House of Commons, about 12 MPs from Northern Ireland in the in Westminster House of Commons. So they're both called MPs. So which one's which? You mean Stormont MP or Westminster MP? And the constituencies overlapped. Obviously, the Stormont constituencies were much smaller because there were more of them. OK, so, um, yeah, there were, there were Catholics who joined the Ulster Unionist Party um, all the way through. They were told the party was so anti-Catholic, there was no rule against Catholics joining. Why would they just not ban us from joining if they really hated us? Louis Boyle, famously, brother of a, a NICRA um, leader, he joined the UUP. But unfortunately, there were some bigots in the UUP and he felt he couldn't make a career in it. If you read uh, The Price of My Soul by Bernadette Devlin, that people's democracy firebrand leader, uh, she recalls um, uh, a Catholic guy, Mr. O'Hara, who, uh, who was known to be Unionist, and this is the late 60s, when it was not exactly the height of fashion for, in the Catholic community. And people joined the Royal Ulster Constabulary. Like I say, you know, it wasn't, by the time the trouble started, it wasn't a high percentage. It fell down to something like 5% of the RIC was Roman Catholic for various reasons, because the IRA and INLA would try doubly hard to kill you. So no praise is too high for these men and women from Catholic backgrounds who joined the Crown Forces, they had to be extra valiant, and they often paid with their lives for their courage. But uh, one of the chief constables of the RIC was Sir Jamie Flanagan, there from 1973 to 77. Obviously, he was Catholic. The UDR, Ulster Defence Regiment, those were part-time soldiers based in Northern Ireland. Um, and uh, it's that they had lots of Catholics to begin with, but then um, the IRA and ILA successfully intimidated out, killed them. Unfortunately, some loyalist terrorists got into the UDR. The UDR was all trying to root them out. And that was another reason why um, not many Catholics enlisted. And uh, Ormrod, he was uh, one of the first um, senior officers, one of the, well, commanding officers of the UDR. And he was Catholic as well. Obviously, Irish Catholic, not from, not from Great Britain. Um, oh, yeah, I almost forgot. Uh, we had uh, a Viceroy of Ireland, um, Lord Fitzalan Howard. The last one, he was Catholic, but he was English, though. And there were so various Catholic politicians in the, the Unionist cause, Sir John Gorman in the Northern Ireland Assembly for some years. Um, there was a daughter of, a, of an IRA man who set up a different Unionist party, not a mainstream one, about how fantastic it is to be from Northern Ireland, whatever your background is. And there were more examples of people who didn't get elected, but who were, uh, were Catholic standing for various Unionist parties. I wouldn't have felt comfortable in the DUP 20 years ago, but I would do now. So, fascinating. Opinion polls show in 2016, the majority of people of a Catholic background in Northern Ireland wanted Northern Ireland to stay part of the United Kingdom, right? It was over 60%. So the Union was incredibly popular. Um, remember how Unionism used to be uh, equated with Protestantism and nationalism with uh, Catholicism. But, you know, 60% of Catholics there wanted to be in the Union. <clears throat> but look at Scots Protestants. And it was only about 50-50 in Scotland. I know that Scots narrowly voted to stay within, to stay within um, the United Kingdom. But despite most Catholics being pro-union, I won't say unionist, uh, the majority of, of them still voted for the SDLP or Sinn Féin. Would really perturb Sinn Féin to know, but something like 20% of those who said they were going to vote Sinn Féin wanted Northern Ireland to stay in the UK. They recognised sort of benefits is not remotely oppressive, very, very free, very, very lucky. The um, United Kingdom rolled out the carpet for His Holiness the Pope at the time the Republic of Ireland wouldn't countenance him in visiting, and many traditionalist Catholics felt that the medium political class in Dublin IV is anti-Catholic, despite people coming from the Catholic backgrounds constantly castigating the Catholic Church. So, yes, there was anti-Catholic bigotry, and the most heinous crimes were committed by by loyalist terrorists, killing people simply for our religious denomination, which is, of course, utterly despicable, reprehensible beyond words. Um, but that doesn't mean that that's not unionism per se. That's not what the union is all about. We can have equality. We can treat people other decently. We don't have to have any religious or ethnic prejudice. Um, so plenty of nationalists, I could even say Republicans, who took oaths to the crown. Michael Collins, well, he said, I will be faithful and bear true allegiance to his gracious majesty, George V, uh, King of Ireland, and his heirs and successors. I haven't got his, his words exactly, but he swore an oath of allegiance to George V in order to um, enter the, um, 
House of Commons of the Irish Free State, I suppose it would briefly be recalled. We then set up the Oireachtas, as now became the Doyle Aaron. Likewise, Eamon de Valera. He agonised about it, but finally, in 1927, he took an oath to George V as King of Ireland. Remember, from 1922, when the Irish Free State was established, George V was not only the King of the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Northern Ireland, but also the King of Ireland. Although the title King of Ireland related to the 26 counties, not the whole 32 counties of Ireland. You could call him King of Southern Ireland, but somehow that doesn't trip off the tongue. Um, so, what was Collins? Was he an absolute charlatan for saying that? I know he hated doing it, he still did it. De Valera, if you're, if you're really a man of your word, you shouldn't do it. And remember the Catholic Church teaches not to take oaths unless you're absolutely sincere about them. So, someone can be a nationalist for absolutist reasons or more instrumental reasons. I'm a nationalist because I'm a nationalist and we're separate and that's it. And even if it makes life worse, I want to separate. Some people are more pragmatic. Does it make life better? Does it make life worse? Look at the economics of it. Um, so, the more the expedient reasons for leaving, oh, well, we'll be richer um, or we're discriminated against, those are largely gone. Uh, lone oilist terrorism now. There's no objectionable conduct from the Crown forces. That's long over. That was a consequence and not a cause of the Troubles. And the Crown Forces have not killed a single person since 1994. And in that time, scores of people have been slain by dissident Republicans. Uh, not just the Yoma bomb, but since then, people that they claim were drug dealers. So 29 of the Yoma bomb and uh, lots of people that they said were petty criminals. Um, and, uh, you know, we, we have another death penalty in Ireland for decades. Even then, it's only after a fair trial, only for grave offences like murder have a chance of appeal, could still be reprieved. So they're absolutely savage, these dissident Republicans. And who, who have the dissident Republicans killed? They, almost everybody they killed was Irish. There were two English soldiers in 2009, since then everybody else was Irish, and almost all of them were Catholics. So there's some defenders of the Catholic community. So Catholic uh, unionism is a long and honorable tradition, and one which I hope to contribute to. My, my county, last time a unionist stood for Parliament, well, still for Doyle Aaron, as it was in 1987, Stan Gebler Davis, who scored a remarkable 0.4% of the vote. It's, it's an achievement I hope to emulate.